All right, this is the podcast with Carla Johnson. Thank you so much for coming to London. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, you know, we meet us now every time, let's say, in, in, in Central P, in Venice, in London. So it's very nice. Yes. You're following my path, the path from the Fast Forward Forum. You and the book, you know it. I it's am. A, I'm excited to see it. I'm it's excited a very to see nice it. chapter. Really good thoughts. And your topic is how to build an innovation dream team. But to start with that, I want to warm up to you a little bit. Um, when was the last time you thought like a kid? You know, I have three kids. Yeah. And, I, and I think this was the oddest thing that I came to realize as a parent is you, you, you look to mold them and teach them things that will help them be wonderful adults and there's all these things that you will pass on to them. But it's this amazing ability that they have to teach adults, and this was my biggest lesson, is to remind you what it's like to be a kid. And I feel like I have this renewed appreciation for what it's like to look at the world through a child's eyes. And they've been able to teach me how to do this where I feel like I do it almost daily. Not every day, because some days are just too too crazy to have that time to, to step back and, and relax and think. That's really cool. It you is. Have, it is. Do you have more than three teachers at home right now? I do. <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're very artistic. They're extremely okay. observant. And, and it's a wonderful way to be taught to look at the world as an adult. So you know, our topic was in awareness to change perspective. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that constantly, permanently, on a daily basis, what is your approach to change you know, your perspective? Oh, my biggest one is just to be mindful. Okay. Because I know that the busier I get, the more I get caught up in, in what has to be done or who I need to call or who I need to respond to. It takes me out of the present and either puts me in the past of, of something I committed to and haven't done or the future of what I need to get done. And it takes away my awareness of, of what's going on in the moment. And the more I can be aware in the moment, the better that I can be to pay attention and be open to changing my perspective or to be open to hearing other people's perspectives. That is pretty nice. Yeah. So if you would have the chance to invite a person to have dinner with, alive or not alive, mm -hmm. who is it? You know, I, I tend to go, um, I go to dinner with a lot of different people. Yeah. So I found that there's a type of person that I love to have dinner with. Uh, one is that they are avid travelers. Yeah. Um, two is that they're extremely curious. Yeah. And three is that they have very broad, different experiences throughout their life. Like I remember when you and I sat next to each other in Venice and had dinner, and I was fascinated by your background in sports and all the different things that you've done. Um, and I find that that the people, I think, who who travel the most and they see the world, they're more curious about the world around them and they judge less and they're open more. And I, and I think that it really gives them a different kind of a, of a change of perspective. They're, they're more patient and much less judgmental about how things should be. And when you have less of that, it's easier for you to change your perspective. Yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. Because you have more or less more opportunities yeah. to get in touch with different kind of cultures, people, archetypes you would say exactly exactly <laughs> and there's so much to learn yeah. from so many different cultures about how they, how and why they do things that's good so is there a right approach to grow into an innovative person you know I always look at at the environment yeah okay because I, I think an environment has a lot to do with how well and how naturally people innovate so when I look at companies and their, and their corporate environments, I look a lot at how rigid are they. Um, there is a lot of talk about, yes, we welcome ideas and yes, we welcome innovation. But then as soon as somebody comes up with a new idea, people say, oh, you know, that's, that's not how we do it around here or we're not that kind of company or there's a lot of excuses that people give for why they won't change. You know, that's, that's an environment that kills innovation really quickly. Um, I think companies that understand their greater purpose, what, what the difference is that they're trying to make in the world with the business that they have, I think that is a huge foundation for helping people understand how to be innovative because it, it gives them a reason to get out of bed every day and, and be excited to go to work rather than just, I'm in marketing, I'm in IT, I'm in, I'm in finance. You understand that the small role that you have 
has a much bigger contribution to the difference that you can make in a world. And that helps a person in their mind see opportunities, you know, have an experience when they travel or in the morning when they go to get a cup of coffee and say, I can bring that into the work that I do and it can start to help make a difference. I see. You were talking in Venice about the, the problems you are more or less facing in the companies with hindrances and barriers, mm -hmm. more or less in the head of the people. Mm -hmm. So how can you more or less deal with that? Because, you know, these are the decision makers. Mm -hmm. So what is your approach to to get them on the right side or to, to change their perspective? You know, a, a, a big part of it is that if you are an executive in an organization and you hire somebody to fill a particular role, what starts to happen is that you look at that person in a particular way and you don't start to see other opportunities that they have to bring their natural talents talents to the to the situation so that's why we went through some of the exercises that we yeah. did in venice is to start to say um and, and i know you and i have done this we'll say well let's get like um, Haimo on board because he's such a natural people person or let's get uh, Heather on board because she's you know very strategic we know these natural tendencies about people yet we hire for a particular label and when we hire only for that label we miss 90% of the potential that a person can bring to a situation so for executives it's really important for them when they want to foster an a culture of innovation is to look beyond just what spot do we need to fill in an organization chart and look at what type of a person and what are their natural abilities do we need to have on a team to start to start to align people to bring cohesion to teams because mm -hmm. that's when you really start to see things become productive and innovative is when when teams click and they really work well together to complement how each other naturally show up in the world rather than just based on job roles. I see. So <clears throat> in this case, is this kind of critic, I don't know, so is this a kind of question about HR and the companies or is it the staffing of the project? Is it kind of not the right way to manage the people? in the right way, mm -hmm. what, is, what, is the, what is the right approach? It's a little bit of all of them. Yeah. When we look just purely at job descriptions and, and filling those, what, yeah, what, yeah. what happens is that you start to create silos within an organization. And you can create silos even within departments. So my background is marketing and I look at big marketing organizations and one, they are their own silo. And part of it is because the rest of the organization doesn't know what they do. You know, the same can happen in, in IT or finance. And then you look within a department and in marketing you have maybe social media, you have demand generation, you have the brand team. They're all their own little silos. But if you start to look at what's the work that we need to have done, to, you know, back to the purpose that we're trying to achieve, and then we say, okay, what kind of a person do we need to have to round out this team? Okay, we have somebody who's a very natural storyteller. That's excellent, but maybe they're a little weak on strategy. So how do we start to shore up teams based on those natural skills? You know, the strategist, the orchestrator, you know, somebody who's bringing those provocative ideas to the table, uh, the psychologist to make sure that we have empathy for our customer, and these kind of archetypes. And then, naturally, you're going to need different skills. But when you only look at the skills, that's why you start to see a lot of infighting within teams mm -hmm. and organizations is because maybe you have either two different, you know, two different of archetypes who don't have an appreciation for the others or too much of one kind and they're all budding heads, but there's clearly a, a disconnect between what people believe and what they value. But is this change of perspective a smooth one or is there a fight? Because you're showing up with your fist, there's a fight sometimes? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, th I think the change of perspective in this is that you have to look beyond the labels that you give people. Yeah for the work that they do. Because there are many people, I mean, I've seen lots of times where it may be an attorney and a lot of people say, oh, if we have to get the legal team involved, like forget it, that's where everything, you know, all kinds of progress shuts down. But I have seen amazingly collaborative attorneys who understand the goal that they're trying to achieve. And they're the ones who bring the cohesion and the collaboration to a very disconnected team. So it's looking at how do we value those things and then understand how to bring out those natural talents in, in people on a team that make them really successful.
And if you come to companies and consult them and give them advice, uh -huh. um, and you come, let's say, back again in one year. So what happened in one year? Mm -hmm. Because to change a company, it's a huge effort. It is. Because it's a cultural sh shift, it's a personal shift, it's a management shift, it's kind of a structural sh shift, it depends. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have, let's say, a time span of one year, mm -hmm. it, is something happening in the companies? Because sometimes I think that the management is resisting what they are doing and they are defending it, like you have mentioned before. Uh -huh. So what is the result of the one year? Can you give us an advice? What is I, absolutely. The first thing I always say is take a baseline and understand the makeup of your entire organization to start with. So I tend to work with very technology and engineering driven companies and they are very strategy oriented because as engineers they like to create plans and then they like to execute them. But sometimes people don't always get along with engineers because it feels like they're too rigid. And so it's great if you can start to to partner those very strategic engineers with somebody who's a culture shaper, who's a natural storyteller, um, somebody who starts to bring the empathy for other employees, either in the organization, on the team, or customers, because engineers may feel, I know this is an amazing product for customers, but customers are saying, yeah, but it doesn't really quite fit into my world the way you think it does, and so what may be a great product might not be the right thing to solve the problem that a customer has. So you'll see that they've, first of all, taken a baseline to understand their, their first makeup. Now the next thing that they start to do is take this into consideration either when they're building teams, who they have already internally, or as they start to bring new people into an organization. So if you have um, an IT team that is also very um, strategic, Mary, um, maybe they need people who are more collaborative because sometimes people can look at IT and they say, you know, here's our rules, um, you are allowed to look at these websites, you're not allowed to look at these sites, you can't connect your own devices onto our network and there's a lot of things that are there for a lot of reasons. However, when you look at somebody who's very strategic and you start to understand the good things that they bring to the team, then it starts to help people not be so uh, resistant to the rules that they have. There's more understanding. And so if you have a culture shaper who can better tell that story of a strategist, then you start to have people relax and then, and then there's better conversations. You have collaborators who seem to be naturally able to connect the dots, you know, among different types of people on a team or, you know, between different teams within an organization. So that's what I start to see is that teams start to have a different dynamic and they're much more open to how they interact with each other after they have an understanding of how they work together. And it's a very good theoretical approach, I would say. In business it's different. Yeah. It, exactly. Uh, and now how long it can take to see that change definitely depends on the original culture that you start to work with. Uh, definitely d depends on that. Yeah, sometimes you have to dig deep, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> in the structure and, and of the company. Organizations have to want to change. Yeah. yeah to want to change. So when does an organization know that they have to change? Generally, they find that they're putting in much more effort, much more energy into making good things happen than they feel is necessary. Yeah. So they'll say, you know, we've been working on this initiative for, for years and we can't, we just can't seem to get traction with it. Like that's a consistent response that I hear. We just can't get traction. We can't get things going. And it's because they have too many people spinning in circles in that way instead of getting everybody aligned in, aligned as a team and cohesive to start focusing in the same direction. I see. You know, Igor Boyka is kind of a rebel, I would say. Yes, I would, he's an orchestrator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was really yes. funny. And the football player as well. So he should be a team player, more or less. Um, he was talking about that the, the people have two kind of barriers. The one is the culture of the company, that is uh -huh. the barrier in their head, you know. And he was coming up with the idea that the true change is coming from external sites, from, from the market, from advisors whatever. So what is your approach? Do you think that innovation is, let's say, external based or is it internal based or what is it? Because Igor is telling us more or less that the old systems are gone right now. Mm -hmm. They have to change mm -hmm. due to different reasons and the people inside the company are kind of blind because they cannot see what's going on in the market. This was kind of his approach. Mm -hmm. So what would you say? 
Is the innovation coming from outside or is it the push innovation or is it the pull innovation? I, I think the most successful and the most sustainable innovation comes from within an organization. Okay. And, and to do that, one of the biggest things is that people need to understand what does innovation mean, like what is innovation, because you can ask 20 different people and probably <laughs> get 40 different definitions of what innovation is. Um, but the other thing is they need to understand like how do I innovate? Because if you look at organizations that have a specific group that's responsible for innovation, they're only a very small part, especially if you look at a big company. So maybe it is a specific innovation group, maybe it's research and development, maybe it's product development, something like that. They may come up with a wonderful idea, but they have 90% of the organization that they have to get on their side to try and you know maneuver it, actually launch it and get it out into the market and manage it and, and have it generate revenue. But when you look at organizations that sustain innovation over a long period of time, they believe that everybody in the organization has not only accountability but responsibility for driving new ideas. Now that doesn't mean that all 100,000 employees come to work every day with a new idea for a product. What they're looking at is how can I do my job better so that I can continue to move that purpose forward. So once they understand that, then they say, okay, what process can I use? And there is, I mean, I've studied the world's most innovative people and teams and companies, and whether they realize it or not, they all follow the same process. And so it's a teachable process that anybody at any level of an organization can learn. Once they learn that process, the next thing that they have is competence. And competence comes from you know, repeating something over and over again. So it just becomes a habit. Because if you get into a situation where, where um, executives will say, we need to be more innovative, but they don't give their people time to practice the process, then it's like anything that we do. You know, if, um, if you're trying to be healthy, but you haven't practiced those things, and you're in a social situation and there's a buffet of food, you go back to whatever your natural habit is. It's the same thing with creativity and, and creative thinking. Now, that leads to the last thing, which is really important, and that's confidence. Is because once you have a process, once you've practiced it and you feel that you know how to do it, and it's, and it's a habit now, that gives you confidence to start um, using it in all kinds of situations to debate ideas to come together and have these discussions as a team that maybe before you were trying to always you know push to the side because you didn't want to have these challenging conversations and I think that's one thing that Igor is really good at is you know he's really going to push it and have those challenging conversations <laughs> that's true yeah. let's come back to the final thing we are joining now it's the book presentation mm -hmm. um, you tried this now for two times yeah. in Central Bay and in Venice as well so what are your takeaways from the fast forward forum you know I think the biggest takeaway is that there is no set way to do anything and there are lots of times I know like me personally I'll think okay I, I have this figured out the truth is this is the way that I'll do it for now until I've discovered something different. And a lot of times, whatever it is that influences my change of perspective as it starts to evolve, comes from places that I never would have imagined. Because I know I've, I've met people at these two events who have changed my perspective in, in ways I couldn't ever see coming. And I think that's part of the beauty of it. Thank you so much, Carla. You're welcome. Thank Hold you so best. much.